five, four, three, two, one. of Sports Today with Peter J. Here's your host, Peter J. Mulroy. Yeah, I'll tell you what, you heard you heard Chris Fowler say it right there on the broadcast last week about the Texas Longhorns. Yeah, folks, they are absolutely a contender to go into Tuscaloosa and not just win, but handle the Alabama Crimson Tide is impressive. Speaks volumes about the job Steve Sarkeesian's doing, Quinn Ewers is doing at the quarterback position. This is a good Texas team. And we're going to get into landscape of college football later in the program. Thank you for joining me. Another Friday edition of Sports Today with Peter J. On this beautiful September 15th. Those of us who are up in the East these know what I'm talking about. Weather outside is beautiful at the end of this show. I'm going to go outside, watch some college football, light up a nice cigar into the Utah State Air Force game that's going to air later tonight. And we've got a big show on tap today, right? The Major League Baseball regular season winding down. A couple of weeks left. A lot taking place as the discussion has been the last few weeks, primarily out of the American League West. And the wild card race in both the AL and the NL continues to be uh, of importance and of interest. And there's payment value to it every night. NFL goes into week two. College football goes into week three. Um... So there's plenty taking place uh, throughout the next couple of weeks and months with the baseball playoffs around the corner while the meat of the football seasons on the NFL and college levels um, continue to develop. And I want to start this week uh, with Major League Baseball and and what's been taking place lately. Um, Just some news and some cleanup duty uh, before we get into what's taking place from the wins and loss and standings department and what the playoff picture looks like today. Big news from the Mets and the Red Sox. Earlier in the week, the Red Sox fired their CBO, the Chief Baseball Officer, Kyan Bloom, after four seasons. Now, this is a guy who helped the Sox get to the ALCS in 2021 before eventually falling to Houston in six. Sub-500 campaign the year after. For Boston, similar to the Yankees, there's no real path to the playoffs. So Boston going in another direction. Gears a little bit and look at the Mets. They've been a president of baseball operations, David Stearns, 38 years old, young guy, stepped down as the Brewers president uh, in 2022, and he'll be a reign with the Mets in October. Now, of note there, with the Mets bringing Stearns aboard, Billy Epler, the Mets GM right now, is going to remain in that role. At least that's what he told as of this week. Even as the organization can, continues to make front office changes, Epler's done some housekeeping uh, and cleaning up of his own, but it looks like he will remain uh, in the current role, and Buck Showalter, as it seems, will be the Mets manager next year. So there will be personnel changes, you would think, on the diamond, and maybe some back office changes as well. But Epler will stay in town. We expect Showalter to be there as the Mets bring aboard David Stearns as the president of baseball operations. Really shouldn't come as a surprise, because this is something I had hinted at Um, throughout the last couple of weeks and months that the Mets uh, and Steve Cohen was interested and wanting to bring in a PBL. And now he's got his operational guy in David Stearns, who's during his time in Milwaukee did a great job 
the talent scouting perspective and in free agency. Uh, you just go back and look at guys he either signed or drafted. It's a Corbin Burns among them. It was it's a nice long list of legitimacy and a resume that says, hey, you know what? This guy knows what he's doing. So now the Mets are going to add on top of that and try to change course from what was a complete failure and a letdown. Now, instead of spending all of that money and trying to build that super team, perhaps the Mets realizing that that doesn't always work. Going a different direction now with a president of baseball operations who can quarterback this thing. And they're chasing teams like the Atlanta Braves, right, who locked up their sixth straight uh, National League East title on Wednesday night. That's their 26th division crown in team history. That's two more than the Yankees and the Dodgers all time. That's impressive. And Atlanta's had some teams a couple years removed from winning a World Series. I mean, throughout the baseball history, this team, at least from what we've seen to this point, 40 games above 500, would be put in the conversation for the greatest Braves teams ever if they're able to finish the deal, especially with the year Acuna's had. And Austin Riley and Matt Olson. These, this is a team that is the complete package. And to lock up a sixth consecutive NL East title with talented teams like the Phillies, an up-and-coming Marlins team, a Mets team that was a 100-game winner a year ago. That's impressive. Now to some of the bad news coming through uh, Major League Baseball. Texas, more on them in a minute. Going to be without Max Scherzer for the remainder of the season. Uh, it doesn't look like should Texas get there that Scherzer's going to pitch in the playoffs either. Uh, he's not going to need surgery for what was termed as a muscle strain. But Texas is shutting down Scherzer, so they don't have his services. Obviously, they haven't had Jacob DeGrom. But as we'll talk about momentarily, they're playing good ball again at the right time. In the injury department as well, Jason Dominguez, the Yankees' uh, young, talented center fielder, only appeared in eight MLB games, smacked four home runs, but he's done. Now we find out that he's going to miss about nine to ten months due to a torn UCL. And guess what? The bad news coming. He will need Tommy John surgery. So this is a long recovery for Dominguez. Nine, ten months puts him out until about July of next season. And the Yankees have had outfield problems for a while outside of Aaron Judge. So this is not the greatest news for a Yankee organization and fan base who's had to really endure it this year with the Yankees not anywhere close to making the playoffs. Um, and Sandy Alcantara, the Marlins ace, continuing to take his recovery slow. Um, this is something that had popped up over the last couple of weeks. Uh, he's eligible to come off the injured list Tuesday with the Marlins still very much in the National League wild card picture. Uh, but it's unknown or not completely known if he's going to be shut down the remainder of the regular season and beyond. Uh, anything the Marlins are able to get from Alcantara without putting him in danger down the road for his future, as good as he is, would be a bonus in this wild NL wild card race. And speaking of those problems that the Yankees have had in the outfield, you know, uh, perhaps hanging on to Brett Gardner for a few years too much, uh, the Aaron Hicks. Now you get a kid like Dominguez. You haven't, we, we haven't really ever gotten the good sample size of Esteban Florial. We know what we have in Judge defending MVP. Rumor breaks today that the Red Sox, and this is rare, super rare, Red Sox were reportedly mulling over a trade that would have sent Alex Verdugo, do you remember Verdugo was having a nice season, was one of the key players in the deal that sent Mookie Betts from Boston to LA and Verdugo back over, that would have sent him to the Yankees in exchange for Clark Schmidt. Now the Red Sox need pitching, Yankees need outfield help, uh, obviously at 275, 13 homers, 53 RBIs this year. Verdugo is a very nice player, would have fit nicely in this Yankees lineup. From a Yankee perspective, and I know Schmidt settled in pretty nicely after a rough start, in a heartbreak, in a, in a, in a heartbeat, had it come to the table. So these division rivals, I mean, rivals like the Yankees, the Mets, who absolutely hate each other, they do communicate. And I think that would have been a deal that you absolutely pounce on if the offer outside of just a straight-up deal, Verdugo-Schmidt, 
any intricacies involved with that other players, cash considerations, picks, whatever, if it all aligned, something the Yankees should have jumped on if given the opportunity. Um, so just a little housekeeping there. Uh, let's talk about this playoff picture because it's it's the hot button issue now with two plus weeks left in this regular season. At- so we get, you know, 15 days left essentially in this regular season. And the American League West continues to be the fun group to keep an eye on. If you go back last Friday, Astros atop the division, 80 and 61. Mariners, a half game behind them. Rangers, three games out. Texas, before this week, for about a 10 to 12 day stretch, they were among the worst playing teams in baseball. Seven plus club ERA, couldn't hit their way anything. Fast forward to tonight. Right now, September 15th, 10 minutes after 7 p.m. on the East Coast. The Astros still atop the division, but now it's the Texas Rangers who picked up two and a half games this week after hammering the Toronto Blue Jays across four games in Toronto. Toronto's a team that's in this wild card mix. Texas went up there and clubbed them 36 to 9 across four games. Coming into this broadcast, Rangers who many people were writing off because of that lousy stretch they had, have a completely reversed course and won six in a row. Half game behind the Astros, very much alive for not just the wild card, of which if the postseason started today, they would be in as the five seed. They can still win this division. And now you've got the Mariners, a game and a half back uh, of the Astros. Well, so you've got two weeks remaining. In the regular season. If the playoffs started today, here's what you have. We'll start with the American League East. Not much of a change at all. Orioles still the top seed. Astros on their heels at number two. Go back a week. This was a Seattle team that was really climbing up that board the last couple of weeks we were talking. They've fallen back. In the wild card round, if it was today, You'd have the number three Minnesota Twins taking on the number six Mariners. Last week, that was the Toronto Blue Jays. The four-game sweep at the hands of Rangers, obviously not helping Toronto. And in the second wild card round, number four Tampa Bay would play the number five Texas Rangers. So changes there. If the playoffs began today, Toronto would be out. You take a look at the National League. Obviously, you've got the Braves at one, Dodgers at two. No change there since seven days ago. In the 3-6 matchup, you'd have the Brewers and the D-backs with the winner facing the... And then the Phillies and the Cubs. That winner obviously getting the Atlanta Braves. Now, what's interesting about this National League wildcard race is that the picture, again, that I just gave you would be the playoff schedule and roster if it started today. It does not. And the San Francisco Giants and Miami Marlins are only a half game out. Oh, by the way, they're the Cincinnati Reds. So you've got three teams within a game of the six-seeded Diamondbacks and the fifth-seeded Cubs in the picture right now on September 15th. With 15 days to go left in the regular season, this is the type of baseball you ask for. Postseason environments exist now for those teams that are on that proverbial bubble. Those who are in don't have margin for error, i.e. the Seattle Mariners. Texas has to keep it rolling. Winners of six straight. The Giants and the Marlins with the Cubs, the D-backs, have flip-flopped for seemingly the last two to three weeks. Now it comes down to crunch time. Those who listen religiously program as always thank you you know how high i've been on this diamondbacks team i think they'll get in i like the reds to get in there i mean this national league tournament however it winds up if it's the giants Phillies comfortably in there if it's the cubs who are playing good ball the brewers obviously atlanta and la you're going to get monster matchups from a pitching perspective and you're going to get teams that are playing their best ball at the perfect time For the last two plus weeks, all of these teams have been playing essentially do by baseball to jockey for position in the postseason picture. 
and that's what you want, especially from an from an entertainment perspective. If you're a baseball fan, this is this is what this is what you dream of to have something of relevance on every night where these games matter. American League, you're keeping your eyes here on the Rangers, the Jays, Astros, and Mariners. I mean, imagine a situation where this goes down the line for two weeks and the Houston Astros completely miss the playoffs. Wouldn't that be something? That's how loaded this AL. Everybody wants to talk about the American League, and that's great. Baltimore and uh, Toronto, Tampa Bay have had great years, and the Yankees and the Red Sox, while they're out, are 500 or better teams. American League West has got the defense champ, the Texas Rangers, who have basically, they've had their moments, superiority, and then just where they look dreadful. And, oh, by the way, I say for the second time, no Scherzer for the rest of the year, and they haven't had Jacob deGrom. So this is even more impressive. Plus, they slaughter the baseball offensively. And a Seattle team who was basically left for dead a month ago. And they had to go on two separate eight-game winning streaks to get back in this thing. Now today, on this on the 15th of September, they're sitting there 16 games above 500, And they're still a game in the loss column out of the lead in the American League West. That's impressive. Playoff started today. The Astros, Rangers, and Mariners would all be in. That's three teams from the American League West. That's impressive baseball. And that's a large enough sample size, obviously, to say that these are legitimate title contenders. You know about Houston's pedigree. You don't have to like the team for, for reasons that are obvious, but they know how to win. And what Texas has done and what Seattle's done coming down this stretch where they still have to play each other, this is awesome stuff. This is what you sign up for. Man. But I, th- these are the moments you live for as a player. Anybody who's ever played a competitive sport, it doesn't have to be professional. You've played games that matter. Games you have to win. Otherwise, you're done, right? Because there's winners and losers in sports. And that's what this is going to come down to in this American League West with playoff positions on the line and in the National League wildcard race as well. This is fun stuff. Really fun stuff. And I tournament that we're getting set up for, I mean, let's face it, with the exception of probably the COVID year where it was a condensed 60, 62 game season, whatever it was, uh, and it was the Dodgers knocking off the, the Rays in the World Series, no post ever not worth the time watching. There's always some element of surprise. But this is as complete of a field, at least today, if the tournament were to start, that we've, we've seen in some time. Atlanta's had some good clubs. This is as good as we've seen in a long time. This Baltimore Oriole team, I, I, I like them to go to the World Series. That's how good this Baltimore team is. And wouldn't that be something? A World Series back at Camden Yards. That would be cool. You talk about an intimate environment to watch a game with a fan base that cares. And some of the nicest people you could ever imagine talking baseball with, they're like Cardinal fans. You don't think they deserve a season like this? This has been fun stuff. Eliminate Tampa from the hot start that they had. And you've got a Twins team that nobody really talks about because of the division that they play in. The American League Central, where the Indians underachieved. The White Sox were woeful. The Royals might be the worst team in baseball. But here are the Twins that are going to play themselves into at least a home wild card round. Barring uh, what would be an epic collapse at this point in the season. And then you've got the big guns, the Mets, the Yankees, and the Padres, who are gone. Barring the greatest miracle in the history of baseball. Which is going to happen. So that's what you have as we continue to knock off days on the month of September. And it's a great time to be a baseball fan. Interesting time, depending on what line you tell in the world of football. If you're a Jet fan, more on that in a moment. Protection breaks down and time runs out. Down goes Rodgers in the sack for Leonard Floyd. Oh, Rodgers sits down and he's coming out of the game. And that means... That a few plays into game one, Zach Wilson, the former number two overall from BYU, who's made 22 starts in the NFL, has thrown 15 touchdowns, 18 picks. 
Yeah, it's Wilson show. You could not make that up. You could, people jokingly saying it on social media is one thing. You could not make that up. And it just a, a gut wrench. You don't have to be a Jet fan to feel sick to your stomach for what happened to Aaron Rodgers four plays into his New York Jet career. On Monday, football runs out of the tunnel on the 22nd anniversary of the, the September 11th attacks with the American flag. Jet fans are loud and obnoxious, and I think the term obnoxious in, 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 in the politest of sense when I say that. They're, they're generally like that. I ha- I've been to many Jet games. I, a lot of my friends are diehard Jet, like to the core Jet fans. I've never heard the stadium that loud for a Jet game, ever, ever. Aaron Rodgers goes down four plays into the game. I didn't see, so I didn't see this happen. My buddy texts me, he goes, you, you, I cannot believe what I just saw. And I said, uh, and I, you just knew what he was talking about. So I put the game, I was checking on my door. I walked away for 20 seconds. By the time they got Aaron Rodgers off the field onto the cart, MetLife Stadium sounded like it was, you were at a funeral. I've never heard the high and the low. I've never heard a jet game that loud. I have never heard a stadium with that many people in it. So quiet while action is taking place. Oh, by the way, the Jets went on to win the game, which is important. They're one and that's better than half the team. Certainly the team they share the freaking stadium with. Can't say that. More on that in a little while. But that was uh, disappointing as an under. Surefire Hall of Famer at 39 years old. Now Aaron Rodgers uh, tore, the, tore the ACL, has to have the surgery. You all know that by now. Zach Wilson gets the nod from Rob Sala. It looks like they have the good relationship, and they're both going to have to lean on one another now. Because you heard all the free agent options now with, with Aaron Rodgers done. He says maybe playoffs. He's done for the year. Hope he comes back at age 40 next year. That would be great. Matt Ryan, Chad Henney, Carson Wentz. Wentz, from an age perspective, yeah, he's talented, but he's another one who's bit by the injury bug. Which direction the Jets going to go? Joe Flacco makes a lot of sense to me because he knows he's been there. And when he was on, well. Now you got a Jets team preparing for the task of stopping this Dallas Cowboys pass rush who got through the Giants offensive line like, like little Giants. Sacks in that game. And the Jet offensive line, folks, and not just because of the Aaron Rodgers thing. It's not very good. And now you got to deal with this Dallas pass rush with Micah Parsons, who's the next coming of Lawrence Taylor. This is a tough spot for Jets to be in, but I'm not going to be one of those guys who comes on the air. And again, it's different from me. 37 years on this, 37, 38, 37 years on this earth as a Giant fan. So I'm coming at it from a different angle, but I'm not going to throw in the towel here with this Jet team. You got a top five defense here. And, and don't think I know Gardner's getting hammered for the way he played uh, against Diggs on, on Buffalo. Let's pump the brakes. That guy's one of one of the best receivers in football. Might be the best receiver not named Justin Jefferson in the NFL. I know he he, he comes across as, in spots, an unlikable guy. And I'm even hesitant to say that because I don't know the guy personally. But from a talent perspective, the breaks there. Not to mention Gardner and and Rodgers are very close. So I don't think that was in his head a little bit that his buddy just went down, who basically was going to carry this team to unprecedented heights for the franchise. This Jets defense, along with the Cowboy defense, are as good as it gets. So no, you don't have to like Zach Wilson. And I'll, and I'll tell people feel about their own quarterbacks that they root for when I talk about the Giants and Daniel Jones momentarily. You don't have to like the kid, but it's his shot now. And you got a couple of weeks to go into this before the bye, uh, which I believe is week seven. And you can reevaluate. Because this is beyond Zach Wilson now just getting his shot. This is, this is his glory moment. In a system he knows, in a head coach that he's built rapport with, there's trust there. And no matter who they bring in, 
no one is going to supplant Zach Wilson right now outside of injury. It's just not going to happen, no matter who they bring in. You pick up the phone and call 41-year-old Phillip Rivers. It is his show un- un- until something goes completely wrong. And it's a tall task to go down to Dallas this weekend. I get that. But to just completely say the season is over and the history with the Jets, I know, is not good. Many Jet fans feel the franchise is cursed. I get it all. But they never convince me for the next couple of weeks, unless the Jets go down to Dallas Sunday and completely lay an egg, that this season, that this season is over. You're one game into the freaking season. And now you got a kid who, just a couple of years ago, you brought in as the number two overall pick, and the fan base overwhelmingly was supportive because you needed a quarterback. Now this kid is going to have his moment. It's either going to work or it's not. And I understand the perspective of Jet fans because the guy who went down was the one and only Aaron Rodgers. But there are going to be moments where the Jets have opportunities to win games. And a big reason why will be not turning the ball over, running the football, and leaning on this. It has been done before. Ask the 85 Chicago Bears. It's been done before. We'll see if Wilson can lead them to where they want. Uh, it's been a, a while before we had this guy chime in, and I was waiting for it. Joe Jet, how you doing, pal? Hey, Peter, how you doing? Long time no speak. How's it going? How you doing? Are you hanging in there? Yeah. You know, Peter, these last five days, what's gone on? And Monday night, you know, I've been to a million games, as you know. Yeah, this was one of the most bizarre scenes at MetLife Stadium that I've ever seen. Yeah. You know, it was 9-11 on top of the Aaron Rodgers stuff, and everybody was ready. The stadium was rocking. I think the biggest crowd ever at MetLife, yeah. right? And, and Joe, from, from the TV perspective, I mean, it was, it was motion picture type stuff. Oh, absolutely, you know? And, 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 I got it. That was the furthest thing from, I guess, any Jet fan's mind that something like this could possibly could possibly happen. And you know, it happened, and it was like you just everybody's heads were in their hands. But you know, Peter, the Jets didn't quit. No, they did not quit. A lot of the fans quit. Some people left. I seen them leaving. I understood it. <laughs> Half time they were going in. Yeah. It was too emotional for everyone, and it was a lot to handle. But you know what? Give credit to this Jet team, at least on that night, for not hanging their heads and sucking it up. And Garrett Wilson with the great touchdown, and then Xavier Gibson to, to end it on a you know a punt return was just, it was fitting for the night. And, oh, by the way, it, it's not just a victory there. It's a victory against a division rival. Uh, you, you know, you get Josh Allen on a bad night. I mean, I, I don't know from your perspective, from what I saw, he he just did not look. Now, I, I get the, the guys in his face, that jet front, the, the first and second level of the jet defense gets after it. I get it. Josh Allen did not look good at all to me, Joe. Well, that's, I mean, that's the obvious of obvious. I mean, besides the interceptions, he gets a low snap ground ball to him. Instead of just landing on the ball, he picks it up, tries to run. Michael Clemens hits him. Quinnen Williams falls on it. Jet ball. You know, he was just, listen, you can't turn the ball over four times. You know, eventually it's going to come back and bite you, and it did. So now I guess if you want to call it a, a little monologue here to start the segment with the Jets, I, I, you've seen all of this as a Jet fan. Yeah. You go to the games, you, you, you've you built rapport with the fan base and media personalities. You, you know this team in and out. Right. I, two questions. Number one, do you, can, do you have any faith in Wilson? And number two, because I, I, I'd be interested to get the longtime Jet perspective here. Roger, not now, now not having him for the rest of the year. Is this shades of kind of what the the, the franchise went through with Vinny Testaverde back in the late nineties? 
Um, obviously, I was there for that game opening day against the Patriots. Yeah. This is the second Achilles I saw get ruptured out there. But uh, that was a little different to me because that was a championship caliber team. That team, remember, was in the AFC championship game. Yes. Lost to Denver, which, I, by the way, I was at that disaster, too, mm-hmm. out in Denver. Okay? Yeah. Which they lost that game. And so all J- retires, all Jet fans cannot wait for this season to start. We have the team. We have no John Elway. We are go- we are the AFC representatives, it was looking like. And, of course, that happened. The Aaron Rodgers. Remember, we never had Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. You know? How do we know the unknown? We know he's great. We know he's great, but we never. You understand? That's yes. the way I took it. Correct. Yeah. All right. So that that's my take on that. How do you feel about Wilson? Well, I, I, I'll tell you what. This guy has lived nine lives in three years. Okay. It's, it's incredible, isn't it? It, it is. Absolutely- in that sense, Joe, it's a rarity. Right. This guy was on his way, maybe finding his way out of the league in a year or so. And now he's got a chance. He has no more excuses. They are much better than they were last year. Defensively, they added, uh, they got Dalvin Cook, Brees Hall is back. They have Lazar. Yes. Joe, did we lose you? All right, right as he was getting into it. I think we lost Joe. So if we get him back, we'll bring him back on. But yeah, I I think you could probably tell. Joe, you there? Okay, we'll see if we can get Joe back momentarily. Um, You could read between the lines there where he was going. This is not the team that Zach Wilson had when he was on the field a year ago. This is a team where you're surrounded by two complete beasts in that backfield with Dalvin Cook coming off a 1,000-plus campaign. Brees Hall, who shouldered the load in the win over the Buffalo Bills. Jets don't win that game without him. Now he's come back from that injury, seemingly healthy, looked good making cuts, going through the seams on the line. He looks good. This is the time now for Zach Wilson, surrounded with these weapons. And I use that 85 Bears example. McMahon, the quarterback, nice player, good player, good arm, smart guy. That 85 Bears defense is the greatest defense of all time. People talk about the 2000 Ravens. You can put the 86 Giants in that mix. I get it. The best defense of all time was the 85 Chicago Bears. When they hit you, your grandmother felt it. That's how hard they hit you. This Jet defense is damn good. And the Jets are going to have to lean on them. The Jets would have had to lean on their defense at parts in the season with Aaron Rodgers anyway. And that's fine. But that's how good this overall roster is. And it's an opportunity now for Zach Wilson to take the reins of that. Let me check in on this guy, see if he's back. Joe, you there? All right, so we lost Joe. If he calls back in, uh, we'll get his points on. But yeah, so the Jets will have a tall task Sunday with the Dallas Cowboys who obviously are coming off, what do you even say? And here's, here's I don't know if it's my favorite or, yeah, my favorite part about that, my wife goes to the Billy Joel concert with her mother. Last minute thing, they, they get tickets, they go at the garden. We saw them a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, it was awesome. So she goes to the Billy Joel concert with her mother. Baby's asleep. Giants kick off with Dallas. I'm sitting down. I have nothing to do but watch the Giants. It's perfect. Opening drive right down the field. They're running the ball. You get the false start by Andrew Thomas. Okay, backs him up. You get the low snap by the rookie center. Things happen. Bill Jones has to fall on it. You set up for the opening field goal. Ah, You'd like to get six there, but we'll settle for three. Good things happen, and Giants are moving the ball. Field goal return for a touchdown so things go from solid to bad with the snap and the field goal try to worse it's and then it went from bad to worse to horrific 
Dallas gets three. Next possession for the Giants. First pass. Batted up in the air. A Saquon Barkley gets drilled. You heard the highlight in the open. Pick six for Dallas. You, up 16 nothing with two minutes and 22 seconds in the first. And then I start to get text messages from people. Are you watching this? What do you think about this? Going to call you in a few. When people ask you when you're a diehard fan, and my, my wife does not enjoy being around me when the Giants play. I don't blame her. I totally get where she's coming from. Win or lose, I'm not enjoyable to be around when the Giants play. I fully admit it. People asking me, you watch it? Are you watching this? What do you think I'm doing? And people, well, how come you didn't answer me? Why do you think I didn't answer you? Are you watching this? It's 16 nothing before I could even finish getting my bottle of water. And then it just, the, the, the complete wheels fall off. And everybody loves to rag on Daniel Jones. Fine. Daniel Jones was a big part of the problem Sunday night. Here's the deal. You can invest in Daniel Jones like the Giants did long term. Oh, by the way, if it doesn't work out, the Giants can get out of it in two years. You can invest in Daniel Jones long term and still say, yeah, you know what? He sucked on Sunday because he did. But you know what? That offensive line is going to get him killed on that right side. And the guy who was leading the charge for the Dallas Cowboys, Micah Parsons, said the same damn thing I'm saying now. It's football 101. If you can't protect your quarterback, some of his decision-making's got to be better. We saw that last year in the playoff game against the Philadelphia Eagles, a game I never thought the Giants would win. I didn't think they'd lose 37-7 or whatever it was. If you can't protect your quarterback where he's got to be running around for his life, you could be Mahomes, Hurts, Allen, Mike Vick, Warren Moon, Joe Montana, freaking Tom Brady. It doesn't matter. You will not be successful. And I don't know that I have ever seen consistently poor offensive line play like I saw it from Mark Lewinsky, the right guard, on Sunday night. Everyone's going to pound on Evan Neal, the right tackle. Don't you think he was trying to make up space a little bit and shield protection over to his left when these guys were coming up straight up the gut and straight off the edge? I can live with Evan Neal getting beat by Micah Parsons. But the second and third rotational guys, no. Not when you're the seventh overall pick. Part of that problem was, too, who was playing to the left of Evan Neal with Glowinski, who, oh, by the way, was not particularly good last season either. The people who don't like Daniel Jones are never going to like him. It doesn't matter. But the kid's got a skill set. Many people don't. You saw that in the opening drive when he was able to have a couple of runs of his own and get the ball down the field. Also, not every one of them, go back and watch that. Not all of those were designed because it was a breakdown of protection. So we had to create plays with his legs. And if you believe in the butterfly effect, bad things happen, yeah, he's probably trying to force that issue. Got to do a better job of not doing that. He's not absolved from the dumpster fire that took place in a 40 nothing shellacking by him most of the fan base despises the most. You have to do a better job of making decisions. But the organization, offensive line coach Bobby Johnson, head coach Brian Dable, all of them have to work in unison to make sure that they are protecting their damn quarterback better. This is going to turn into Eli Manning all over again. And people love to rag on Eli down the stretch of his career. Now, they've kept him in town probably too long, but he's a living freaking legend. Not so easy, a la Derek Jeter. Probably stayed around too long with the Yankees, but it's hard to get. I get it. The people couldn't wait to hammer Manning at the, the, the end of his career. Like, he didn't win two Super Bowl MVPs. They couldn't protect him. And it's happening again with Daniel Jones. Folks, I, I cannot believe some of the things I'm reading on social media about how bad Daniel Jones was Sunday. He had no time. This is this is football. This is like teaching someone the letter A or the number one. This is football 101. If you don't protect the freaking quarterback, you're going to lose. 
and it was dis- a disgusting display. It, it was a jo- I'll tell you what, the, the one good thing that came out of it, I know he had the bad snap. I thought Schmitz, the center, had a halfway decent game for a rookie center. And I think the first round draft pick, Banks, the corner from Maryland, acquitted himself nicely on a defense that really would play with half the field the whole game. Now, you got to get off the field. Trey Hawk on fourth down did a nice job with the tight end. Dak Prescott didn't have to do anything. Turn around the ball and, and hand the ball off and let Tony Pollard do the job because the Giants offense was able to do absolutely Worst loss for the Giants in 73 when they lost 42 nothing to the Oakland Raiders. I have never been more embarrassed to be a Giant fan in my life than I was Sunday night. And I don't turn games off. I sat there and watched the whole damn thing. And it was a disgrace. Now, we all overreact. You know, there's no style points in the NFL. Giants can just put this, put it in a hole and bury it, which by all accounts they're doing. So they're, they're taking accountability, which is something the organization hadn't done. But now you got to get ready for the 425 against Arizona this week where you hope to have your left tackle, Andrew Thomas, who's questionable. Tight end Darren Waller's full go. You've got to get more from the outside weapons, but you have to have time to be able to get him the ball. The one delivery Jones was able to get to Isaiah Hodges, this guy freaking fumbles the ball. And everybody's blaming Daniel Jones. He throws it to Barkley. He gets smacked, pops up in the air. It's a pick six. They're all accountable for the debacle. But if you don't protect your damn quarterback, you got no shot. And the Giants should know that better than anybody from what they've seen, with the exception being last year. It's ridiculous. Uh, I think we have Joe back. So let's bring him in. Then I'm, I'm going to get into uh, my weekly picks and then some college football before we get out of here. Joe, what's up, man? Hey, Pete, I'm back, man. Sorry about that. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I was <laughs> when you cut off, I was able to get my little my little Giants segment in there. So yeah, I I'm did, glad I did. I did hear it. I did. Yeah. And you know what? One thing about the Giants when we get back to the Jets, you yeah. know what, Peter? Sometimes in sports, things happen. Everything went wrong. <laughs> You know, it was just a, a total downhill from the block punt or whatever happened there. You know, listen, go into Arizona and now take it out on them. Yeah. Because you have, don't you have Frisco on that Thursday night? Yeah, the, the, and, and the schedule to open the season is brutal, all the more worse. Exactly. Well, you know what? And listen, one thing, though, Pete, in the Brian Dable era, 0-6 between Philly and Dallas, that has to change. Yes, Sooner recent later, history between both be has not been good, but with Dable, it's 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 a donut. Right, you got to stop beating the big boys. Just saying, you know. But anyway, to the Jets, you know what? This is where coaches, Peter, yeah. really earn their keep. Of course. Now they got to switch the playbook around. And what are they going to make Zach Wilson? Obviously, I imagine they're going to try and run the ball, game manage it a little bit, you know. Brees Hall, you got uh, Dalvin Cook, Michael Carter, and I think the Jets are going to do it on a ground and pound, old Giants, Bill Parcell style. I mean, th- that's, and they're certainly set up to do that. Oh, you can run the ball with this offensive. I think they can run block good, Peter. They have problems pass blocking, it looks like. And believe me, that's a thing. Some long block, you know, they can run block well, but they can't yeah. pass block. The Jets seem to be bolts for these guys, as we saw last week. So let's just hope they can keep it going. Well, listen, we'll see. I, I'll definitely be uh, in touch with you. Uh, right. I'm rooting for them. I mean, this is a, now it's a unique spot that the Jets are in, and we'll see how they're able to tread the war through this. But, uh, Joe, as always, brother, it's good to hear from you. Good to talk to you. And uh, enjoy the football this weekend. Go Jets. Absolutely, man. Best of luck to you as well, Peter. We'll talk. All right, dude. All right. I'll talk to you. Our buddy Joe Jett, hadn't heard from him in a couple of weeks, but it's good to hear uh, him call back in and, and with all this chaos going on around, uh, good and bad, uh, New York football. So you get the Jets in Big D this weekend. Giants go to Arizona. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on. There's a lot on the table here. The good news for the Jets, they start the season 1-0. Through all that Aaron Rodgers chaos and not having him, the Jets come out and they win an overtime game against the division rival, 1-0, and 1-0 in the AF East. Protection. So we'll see what they're able to do with Wilson and company um, as we get set to open to continue uh, week two in the NFL, which opened Thursday night. 
with the Philadelphia Eagles taking care of Vikings backdoor cover late with a Minnesota score. Those of you who have tabs on that from a uh, over under Minnesota loses by 34 to 28. So I just can't stop anybody. So I start 1 0 there. These are outright picks for week two. I took Philly. I thought Philly was going to put on him. He really did outplay him at late four made it. And it really was. Um, you know, Philly didn't have to do too much. And that was all too well. Baltimore goes to Cincinnati this week. And I like Baltimore. I like Grant Paul, the plan. I like Lamar Jackson. And I like them on the road against the Cincinnati team. That looked awful a week ago. You got Chicago going to Tampa Bay. It's not the practice game on paper. Chicago did not look good today in Jordan. They do uh, at Soldier Field. Give me the puck. I mean, Baker Mayfield and Tampa going 2 0. They took down Minnesota on the road week one. They say they go 2 0. They win against Chicago uh, this week in Tampa Bay. Green Bay. Goes to Atlanta. I wouldn't love it. was as impressive as yours to be. It's a rival in a debut uh, that you really had in quite some time. I like Green Bay on the road, as I like Indianapolis uh, on the road in Houston. Should have a matchup there. Rookie quarterback Stroud for Houston. Anthony Richardson um, for the Colts. Indianapolis to go into Houston and get that victory. Kansas City goes to Jacksonville. I've been very high on this Jacksonville team. They got a tough test on the road in Indy last weekend. You know what? Uh, Travis, I understand he's back this week. That's going to help out that uh, Kansas City receiving core after the opening week loss on Thursday night to Detroit, uh, where Kadarius Toney had three key drops. So getting Kelsey back helps. I'm going upset here. Give me Jacksonville at home over Kansas City. Go to Tennessee. I like the Chargers there. You got Vegas going to Buffalo. Buffalo is about a nine and a half or eight and a half point favorite. Something like that. I like Buffalo. Again, these are all outright picks. Josh Allen bounces back against a talented but not just there yet Raiders team. A one point victory over Denver a week ago. So give me Buffalo at home. Seattle to Detroit. I like the Lions there. This is going to be some atmosphere in Detroit for this uh, home opener after they took down the defending champs at Arrowhead last week to open the season. Uh, a fake punt on fourth down, backed up in your own territory. Dan Campbell, the head coach, has got guts. And I, Detroit to outgut Seattle. Uh, Seattle would drop to 0-2 the loss of Detroit would go to 2-0. You know, Giants, look, it went from bad to worse to awful to just unspeakable for the Giants. Week one against Dallas at home. Drub, embarrassed, outplayed, out hustled. You got to have a short term. And I just think the Giants have their you know what together from a collective. Jones and company bounce back. Hopefully, Thomas is able to anchor the line at left tackle. And we'll see if any changes are made. Maybe it's a Josh Zudu stepping at, at right, depending on the development. Maybe we see a Marcus McKeithen. Will Beatty, eh, eh. Shane Lemieux, eh. But I would like to see a little bit more of Zudu. Perhaps McKeithen uh, as a swing tackle. Ben Bredesen, I thought, played pretty well at left guard. So there's opportunity there for the, for the Giants um, to be successful. I think they get the win Sunday in Arizona. San Francisco, I like them over the Rams in L.A. Rams offense looked pretty good. Sans Cooper Cup. Uh, but I, this San Francisco might be the most complete team in the league. And I like them to beat uh, the Rams. Uh, I'm taking the Cowboys over the Jets, probably closer than people think. But I've got to go Dallas at home, riding high after the emotional thumping of the Giants. Washington goes to Denver. Give me Denver to get on the board here uh, with a win outright. Sean Payton's first victory will be the home opener for Denver. I like them to win. I like Matt Miami on the road over the, like the Saints on the road over Carolina. And the Monday night game, give me Cleveland going to Pittsburgh and getting the victory. So there you have it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm high. You know, you, 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 you probably feel pretty confident in Dallas the way they looked a week ago uh, with the uncertainty of the Jets not knowing what they could get Zach Wilson. And I like Cleveland on Monday night uh, to roll over Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh and Kenny Pickett did not look good at all last week in their debut against the 49ers. Granted, that's a, 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 you know probably in the top three ranks uh, of teams you expect to win the Super Bowl this year. But I really like um, this this Cleveland team, the way they're playing at least a weekend on both sides of the ball. 
and I expect them into Pittsburgh on Monday night um, and earn that victory uh, over the Pittsburgh Steelers. Hit subscribe and don't miss the next episode. Sports Today with Jay. Yeah, again, for those listening live on September 5th, we appreciate it about 10 minutes shy of 8 p.m. on the East Coast here. Uh, Sports Today with Peter J. Uh, I want to get into some college football here. And you heard me say it in the open. And and Chris Fowler, the play-by-play man for, for ESPN a week ago doing the Texas-Alabama game, pretty much said it. You don't know what's going to happen. But this Texas team is a legitimate contender. And to win 34-24 over Alabama in Tuscaloosa, Something that used to be impossible makes it all the more impressive. Quinn Ewers, uh, the Longhorns quarterback, clearly a Heisman favorite. Three touchdowns, 350 through the air, 24 of 38 passing. Jatavion Sanders, one of the, the, the more reliable targets in America. Five catches for over a buck ten. The difference there was quarterback Jalen Mill, for the things that he did well, two touchdowns, the two picks were costly. And he completed less than 50% of his passes uh, for 255 yards. And he ran for another 40 plus on 15 carries. So you were kind of wondering, coming into this week, would Alabama and Nick Saban make changes? And this wouldn't be the overreaction. Right? You, lose the, the, uh, you lost to a team that could potentially find its way into the Final Four. And don't forget, this is the last year of the four-man playoff, 14 playoff. It expands to 12 next year. So Texas could very well, if they were able to run the table here, or at least have the, the one loss, potentially, be a Final Four team. And Alabama has no margin for error now. Will Alabama make changes? And as of Friday, for those listening live, at around 1, 2 o'clock, nothing had happened. Come about the 3 o'clock hour news breaks that Jalen Milrow moved as Alabama's quarterback. In his place will go former Notre Dame starting quarterback Tyler Buckner. So Buckner's going to get the start Saturday against South Florida. Interesting to note that Tyler Buckner transferred over to Alabama when there was really no clear path for him to win the job in South Bend again. And he followed former Notre Dame offensive coordinator Tommy Reese to Alabama after he left South Bend for Tuscaloosa. Now Buckner's going to get his shot. Smart player, good legs, and the arm was developing prior to an injury last year. And that's, I think, what Alabama, a little bit more consistency in the aerial attack. Buckner, not necessarily known for that during his time in South Bend, but from my perspective, I thought his arm was a little underrated. So we'll certainly see that uh, this week when the Tide, uh, coming off the loss to the Longhorns, uh, go down to South Florida. Uh, North Carolina, great game. If you watched it last week, got by App State in overtime. They go to 2-0 on the season. Quarterback Drake May, one of the best in America. Uh, leading the way, and Ole Miss got past Tulane last week. And how about the Hurricanes? You kind of figured with Mario Cristobal leading the charge, this would be a revamped unit, but it might take some time. All Miami did was absolutely hammer Texas A&M to vault into the AP Top 25, 48-33 at home. One of the bigger wins we've seen Miami have over the last couple of years as the program is really – I don't want to say become irrelevant because a Miami program will never be irrelevant, but they're not the Miami that we, you know, from yesteryear uh, that we got to know as those hard hitting physical championship caliber teams and out of the gates, they're two and up. And, and, and again, this is a Texas A&M program. It blows my mind how Texas A&M continues to underachieve with the talent they recruit. So it, it, it obviously would boil down to coaching in many aspects. But what Texas A&M gives you up front on both sides of the ball, playmakers on the outside, to lose games in the fashion that you go back to a year ago, Appalachian State, this year with Miami, it just doesn't make any sense to me, which is why I'm hard to take Texas A&M and Jimbo Fisher seriously. Now, they could go on a run here, and there's no shame in losing to Miami, but if you watch the game last week, Texas A&M looks awful. You look at week three, you've got a big slate here. LSU, 1-1, one one, pounded Grambling a week ago. That was a week removed from getting pounded themselves by Florida State. They'll go to Mississippi State. And I'll tell you, what, a lot of people are doing it. This is a noon kick on ESPN, noon on the East Coast. I like Mississippi State in this game. 
You know, quarterback Will Rogers from Mississippi State is smart. He's savvy. And this running back, Jacavius Marks, has got the goods. And forget about covers. I like Mississippi State to win this game Saturday outright. Kansas State goes to Missouri. This is interesting. This is year four of the Eli Drinkwitz era in, in Mizzou. And he's trying to take Missouri to consistent contention in the SEC, something that hasn't happened for the Tigers in a while. Now, they're 2-0, South Dakota and Middle Tennessee State, the victories to open the year. Now they'll get a Kansas State team that comes to town, efficient running the ball, and a savvy defense. I think Missouri gets the victory. This is the time of game, type of game Missouri has been waiting for since Drinkwich came on uh, to coach this team. And I think they get their big statement victory to move to 3-0, and which would almost assuredly put them back in the rankings. South Carolina goes to Georgia. Georgia's about a 28-point favorite. This is a 3.30 kick Saturday. Georgia's around to lose the game, even with Spencer Rattler playing quarterback for South Carolina. Georgia's not losing this game. But if they screw around, it could get dicey late. I, I don't, I would never say, hey, outright South Carolina. No. But is it going to be closer? Do I think if you're, if you're playing the covers, that South Carolina might cover this game with Georgia at 27 and a half, 28 last I checked? Yeah, I do. All right. Uh, other games of note, Minnesota goes to North Carolina. They're two, both 2-0. Two and oh. uh, You know, Minnesota really trying to get more consistency with P.J. Fleck. Uh, I just, Carolina's going to be too much at home with their offense. And then you've got Washington and Michael Penix who's probably the most fun quarterback in the country to watch. They're their eighth-ranked team in the country, going to Michigan State. Both teams 2-0. Now, this is interesting. Michigan State out of the gates 2-0. Their head coach, Mel Tucker, remains on suspension suspension uh, for investigations into sexual misconduct. And this is a saga that continues to develop. So where might the mindset of this Spartans football team be uh, Saturday? I would have picked Washington outright. But I think Penix and company are going to go into East Lansing and damage this weekend um, as Washington, I would expect, to move to 3-0. Penix remains a, a Heisman favorite. Uh, the kid is just absolute since transferring from Indiana. Tennessee goes to Florida. Uh, it should be an interesting game. Uh, it Saturday, under the lights, ESPN, 7 p.m. on the East. I like Tennessee in that game. If you watch Florida week one against Utah, did it, uh, mistake-prone football, not that they can't recover from this, and these SEC matchups are always hit you in the mouth style. I just think Joe Milton for, for Tennessee, who can run and he's got some arm, is too much for the Gators. Uh, 2.30 p.m. East, you got the Peacock game. Uh, number nine, Notre Dame, 3-0 and out of the gates against Central Michigan. I think the Irish are like a 27 or 28-point favorite in this one. It might have dropped a little bit. Um, you don't see Notre Dame having too many problems. Now, Notre Dame's got, not going to do- blow the door teams like they've been doing every week this will be this is you know you're not going to sleep on any team and that's the best thing Marcus Freeman has done since come on board with Notre Dame and I think they kind of learned their lesson from a year ago losing to an underwhelming Marshall team and a team both at home where you, you got 12 cracks at this thing and you can't sleep on anybody and all Notre Dame has done offensively is put it on people now granted they haven't been playing the upper echelon teams but then on the road last week against a good North Carolina State team in, in lousy storm conditions, a, a two-hour break due to lightning in the area, and on the first play from scrimmage, it's an 80-yard touchdown run. You heard it in the open. That's good coaching to keep those kids ready on the road, hostile environment against a team with a veteran quarterback and a good defense, and Notre Dame goes in there and dominates again in the fourth quarter. Now you got Central Michigan this week as a tune-up for what takes place September 23rd at 7.30 p.m. in South Bend, Ohio State comes to town. So this is a big moment for Notre Dame tomorrow against Central Michigan. Put it on them and get ready and stay healthy for when the guys come to town um, on the 23rd. Which, look, you talk about big games. I mean, that'll be must-see TV against two top 10 teams, assuming there's no hiccups this week. But the way Sam Hartman's, is play, Sam Hartman's played for Notre Dame under center, um, you know, the leadership aspect is there. And that is something that Notre Dame hasn't had from a leadership and, a, and an overall talent standpoint 
from the quarterback spot in a while. Ian Book was a winner. Jimmy Clausen had, had everything, they, but they could never get it going as a cohesive unit. So far, so good for Sam Hartman leading this Iron team. Ohio State's got Western Kentucky uh, this weekend in a matchup of two 2-0 two teams. Ohio State's home. Uh, those interested, that's a 4 p.m. kick on the East Coast. Fox is going to anchor that coverage. I guess that'll be Gus Johnson, um, which is always a fun listen. So uh, as we just kind of get, get close to wrapping things up, that's the breakdown in college football this week. You got big games there, right? I gave you my thoughts on who I like this weekend. I gave you my NFL picks. There, there's a lot to be desired this weekend. And oh, by the way, all these playoff races you have going on um, across Major League. And at this point in the season, with, with what is the earlier starts here, you know, you're looking for bounce backs from the Giants. You know, the Vikings laid another egg on Thursday. We'll see what the Bears offer. Can Jordan Love do it for a second consecutive week? There's lots going on in the National Football League. Even early in this season, some good storylines. And the football as well. But I'm telling you, you're going to want to pay attention to these playoff races in Major League Baseball. Because this is the, the, the year now with two weeks left in this season. Two weeks left to go where the picture starts to become a little more clear um, as we get closer and closer to seeing who's in and who's out. Just some more news. I mentioned it earlier. Travis Kelsey uh, is set to go this weekend. Uh, Kansas City Chiefs. So he's going to make his return at his debut, along with defensive lineman Chris Jones, uh, who was absent for the Lions game. You heard uh, Mike Tirico say it on the broadcast, put an asterisk next to the victory for the Lions this week. That's absurd. It's the National Football League. They went out and they smacked around the defending champions and out-coached him and out And we'll get a chance to see what the Chiefs look like this weekend on the road in Jacksonville. Like the Jaguars in the game, but it's going to be nice to see Kelsey run it around with Patty Mahomes again. Nick brought back uh, Ryan Archibiacono. Uh, they had him for a season a year ago. 29-year-old from Villanova, so also he's going to add some depth. Uh, we don't know the terms of that deal yet. Ryan Archibiacono uh, has rejoined the New York Knicks. And just before we get out of here, uh, off note out at Silver Rock, sort the Fortnite championship, uh, Heath Gala. Off to a roaring start, followed up the round one, 68 with a second round, 64. He's got a two-shot lead over SH Kim and Eric Cole. Dustin Thomas, who's on the Ryder Cup team, we know that now, playing well. 69, 67, he's four shots back, minus eight. All right, we say it every week, and I can't stress it enough. Thank all of you for the consistent listenership and viewership and following the social pages, especially this uh, Instagram page, right? Uh, working towards scheduling. I guess my buddy Bruce Stein's going to join us in a few weeks to talk some NFL and MLB. And that's the perfect time to get Bruce and those more baseball than anyone. I've been working with Major League Baseball Network for uh, years and years. Chris Roots goes old Bruce to show high heat. Uh, and everybody knows who the dog is. It'll be great to have my buddy Bruce uh, in a couple of weeks. As always, you can follow us on all the social platforms. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, uh, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, right here on Podbean. Do a great job anchoring as the mothership. And, of course, Spotify. I'll be back next weekend for the September 22nd edition of Sports Today with Peter J. live at 7 p.m. on the East Coast. As always, I appreciate everything. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the games. And as always, go Irish. Sports Today with Peter J.